Welcome back to Black News Tonight. The murder of George Floyd has exposed the need for a global conversation on racial injustices. In the national scope, it's also encouraged many people to challenge the legacy of white supremacy and to be more intentional in the fight against inequality. And that's the case for our next guest. He is former ACLU Deputy Legal Director Jeffrey Robinson. He's also the writer and producer of the documentary, Who We Are, a chronicle of racism in America. Take a look. We had been on a path toward racial justice that was amazing. There was the Civil Rights Act, the Voting Rights Act. We were at a tipping point. Once again, America is having to look at issues of race dead in the eye, and once again, we are at a tipping point. And the question for all of us in this room is, what are we going to do about it? Combining Robinson's personal story and archival footage and, of course, interviews, the film invites us to take a critical look at America's slavery past and be involved in building a more just future for black Americans. Who We Are has been awarded in many film festivals around the country, and it's going to be released in New York and L.A. theaters on January 14th. And now here to talk about this and much more is the writer and producer of Who We Are, a chronicle of racism in America, the man's name is Jeffrey Robinson, and we are so honored to have him here. Jeffrey, so good to see you. Uh, you start your documentary mentioning that America was making a lot of progress to achieve racial equality, but after MLK's murder, it reached a tipping point. Why do you think racial justice was, in, was within reach, and what happened for that to change? Well, number one, thank you for having me. Um, I think America has been at tipping points in at several points in our history, at least three other points before this one we're in right now. Um, but when Dr. King uh, came to Memphis for the sanitation strike, he had been on essentially a 12 or 13 year run since 1955. And remember what we were coming out of at that time separate but equal had been the law of America for 90 years after the Civil War. And in a 12 year period, Brown versus the board is decided. We are integrating lunch counters. We are integrating schools. We are integrating uh, public accommodations. We are integrating interstate travel. There, the Voting Rights Act, the Civil Rights Act, there was a movement because people were taking a real hard look at exactly who we were as Americans at that point. And when Dr. King got killed in my hometown of Memphis in 1968, it felt like we just rolled back because what came next was Richard Nixon and the war on drugs. And that started a decline in our community that uh, was significant. Wow, it's a provocative thesis. You know, some of us <clears throat> are a little more cynical <laughs> and, and believe that that trajectory would have happened either way. But, but it's an interesting place to investigate and, and, and sort of think through the possibilities of racial democracy in general. And to make a documentary on that, I think, is, is so necessary. What inspired you uh, to create the documentary? And, and why do you think that film as a tool, as a mode, as a genre, uh, is, what, is a solid way to, take, to advocate this, as opposed to a book, as opposed to a series of newspaper articles, as opposed to you know, all, all the sort of things we've been seeing? Uh, I think there are several things that, that go into that. And uh, because of uh, personal circumstances in my family, back in 2011, my 13-year-old nephew in New York became my 13-year-old son in Seattle. And all of a sudden, after years and years as a criminal defense lawyer confronting racial injustice in the criminal legal system, it got really personal because now this young man is in my home. And I didn't have other children, and I got terrified. So I started to read. I don't even know what I was looking for, but what I found were things about the history of white supremacy and anti-Black racism in our country that I had never heard before. And I've had one of the best educations in America, Marquette University and Harvard Law School. And so I went into a depression, quite frankly. I thought, you ignorant, stupid piece of whatever. 
How could you not have known this stuff? How did you not understand this history? And when I finally started to forgive myself, I started asking myself, well, maybe I should blame my teachers. And then I thought, well, if they didn't know, how were they going to teach me? And I started wondering, I wonder how many Americans really know the details of our history. And I'm talking about an unbroken line of white supremacy and anti-black racism from 1619 to today. And it's not just me saying this as an opinion, it's going to original source documents. It's going to events in history that no one can deny. And this is the look at who we really are as a country and why America looks like it does today when it comes to the gap between white America and black America in virtually every aspect of living. Uh, in, in the film, you mix different types of, uh, in who we are, a chronicle of racism in America, you, you mix different types of footage. Uh, your 2018 town hall speech, your personal story, your interviews. As a filmmaker, talk to me about how you were able to make those decisions about combining those different strands. Uh, I was, uh, the luckiest day in this, the life of this project was in April of 2017 when I met Sarah Kunstler, who is the daughter of William Kunstler, uh, the famous civil rights lawyer. And she and her sister Emily were filmmakers. Sarah saw my presentation and she and Emily called me and said, we need to meet with you. We want to make this into a film. And you're asking earlier, like, why a film instead of a book? And I think that in my study as a trial lawyer for over 40 years, in my education, uh, in my looking at history, one of the things that I've come to understand is the power of narrative. It is an incredibly powerful force in the way human beings understand the world. And film gives you an opportunity to tell a narrative in so many different ways. So as you suggested, part of this film is uh, me on stage at Town Hall Theater in New York City in front of a packed house, talking about this history that's the backbone of the film. Part of the film is archival footage. We actually found uh, in an old Fox movie tone file, footage of June 1st, 1921 of the Tulsa massacre and we paid to have it digitized. So that will never be lost. Um, and then we were able to interview Mother Randall, 107 years old, one of the two or three surviving people mm -hmm. from the Tulsa massacre. When you see those images and hear those words coming from people who have lived the story, it has a power that other mediums don't. And so I was able to hook up with two brilliant filmmakers who were dedicated to putting on film the ideas that I had and the message that I wanted to deliver without trying to change it or edit it or make it into something that it wasn't. Wow, well, it's a powerful job you did, and I can't wait for the world to see it. These New York and L.A. premieres are just the start. Everyone, you will have access to this amazing and award-winning film uh, very, very soon. Jeffrey, thank you for joining the show tonight, and congratulations on the film. Uh, everybody, make sure you watch Who We Are, A Chronicle of Racism in America. The documentary will be released this Friday, January 14th, again, in New York and Los Angeles theaters and lots of other places very, very soon. Everybody.